Ms. Edmonds Pauly is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations here at the University of San Diego. She focuses on local and state politics in Mexico, the decentralized and its democratization in Mexico and Latin America, the ability to of local gov governments to exercise autonomy, financial autonomy, and the relationship between politics in media, Latin America, and in Latin America. Please welcome Ms. Ellie Edmonds Polly. Good morning. Uh, luckily, I won't be talking about most of that, so hopefully it won't be too terribly boring for you. But I wanted to um, welcome you to USD. Um, we're so glad to have you all here at this event. Um, as Frida pointed out, I am a professor here of political science and international relations. I teach classes on international relations, um, the politics of Mexico, Latin America, US Latin American relations. Um, among other things. Um, and those are the, area, the areas that really interest me. Um, and so when I was invited to, to talk today, I thought that um, the best way to sort of make a connection with you and the, the um, topics of this conference was to think a little bit about human protection and human security, particularly in the context of uh, the war on drugs in Mexico which is something that, uh, unfortunately, uh, at least if you're anything like the group, the first group, um, there are probably a number of you, because you live in Mexico, experience some aspect, uh, hopefully indirectly at most, uh, but has had a huge impact on society in, in Mexico and, of course, uh, across the border because we live so close and because we share so much information and so many of our people right in this region. Um, so before we uh, what, what I talk specifically about um, the about human security, I wanted to just get a you know very quickly kind of get your impressions or um, input on what you think why I guess there's a drug war at all, right? I mean, what is it and why is it happening? Would you say? I like for this to be interactive, but you guys have to do your part. Yes. Well, like us in the US and other people around the world have a huge demand for illegal drugs. And because they're illegal here, um, you know, it has to be these kind of covert operations that get the drugs from one place to another. And so because there's such a high demand, I think that's why there's so much conflict and um, like conflict over power through Mexico, because I know a lot of drugs come through Mexico. So to get to the US. OK, all right, good, yeah. So we're talking about a supply and demand issue, right? We in the United States consume a lot of illegal drugs, right? Cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, right? I mean, you could sort of go down the list, right? We, we like our drugs, and we can afford our drugs, right? As a society, we have a high level of um, so what's sort of disposable income, right? And so that enables us to pay relatively high prices for these drugs that we like to consume. Okay, but as you, and your name? Roya. Roya, you're, as Roya points out, uh, they're illegal, right? They're not supposed to be in society at all, right? So we have this situation where there's this huge demand for something that we're not supposed to have. Right? OK. Um, why do you think, maybe somebody other than Roya, uh, why, why do the drugs come from Mexico? I mean, how, where does Mexico, yes, please. Well, it's close. It's close to America. OK. So that makes it easier to to get it into the United States? Yeah. OK. Definitely, that's part of it, right? Anybody know how long the border between the United States and Mexico is? Long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Longest in the world, right? Uh, I mean, land border, I believe. I think that's right. Uh, uh, about 1,500 miles, right? 2,000, almost, I think it's almost close to 2,000 miles. I mean, that's huge, right? There's, there's lots of access, right? Not to mention airports and, you know, uh, maritime ports and all of that type of thing, 
Okay, so that's part of it also, but, but why else? Yes? Well, um, having a lot of family in Sinaloa, mm -hmm. I know that in society it does become kind of, we speak of it as something illegal, but in this society, for example, it becomes kind of like a second route to life. Because if you, it used to be, for most of these people, it used to be enough just to have a little land or farm or something of the sort because I have family that lives there. But now that more for example, big corporations are getting all this land and farming for them, it sort of comes up that they are part of a system and that in Mexico it becomes, oh, this is hard to word, it would be a lot more difficult to bring a corporation that makes illegal drugs in the United States with so many regulations when there's a lot more space to make that corruption happen in Mexico because of systematic problems. Okay, wow, so there's lots tied up in what you just said because uh, when we have, we have geography matters, right? We also, it sounds to me like what you were saying is that um, it also provides economic opportunities, right, that might not otherwise exist or that, are, or at a minimum, are not as lucrative, right? Um, and, and that's tied to much broader issues of the, the structure and design of the Mexican economy and, and political system, right, that, that have to do with creating uh, economic opportunities, right, and all that type of thing. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that it, there's no way to have a holistic understanding of this issue without appreciating those exact issues, right? Um, there, and I mean, we could also, if we go back to geography, we could think about the fact that there are some areas of Mexico that are absolutely perfect for the cultivation of things like marijuana um, and poppies. Right? That you can't grow those things just anywhere. You can't grow, for example, cocaine because it's not high enough up in the, and it doesn't have the sort of mountain, mountainous terrain that you need to actually uh, grow the, the, cocaine, the coca leaves right, that are the base of cocaine. Uh, but that's where geography matters too, right? Because uh, the, Mexico is, has always been a very important point of transshipment. Right, where country, other countries like Colombia, for example, or a country, Andean countries cultivate the drugs and they send them through Mexico and they, that's how they sort of enter into the United States. Okay, all right. Well, but uh, so we, we have some preliminary idea then of sort of why this drug war is, is happening. Um, and, and a lot of it sort of hinges, you know, the war aspect on the fact that this is an illegal practice, right? Uh, that um, and so if you're engaged in illegal activity and, and you are, um, you know, governments are trying to make sure that this is sort of not happening, you're, go you're going to end up with a situation that, at least in this case, you know, looks like a war. Uh, most pe a lot of people think that, the, that this war began in 2006 with the election of um, Felipe Calderón, who was the president of Mexico, not, not isn't now, but was uh, from 2006 to 2012, and he made it uh, a point to fight the war on drugs. But in fact, this is a problem that goes back much further than that. Um, and, and we look at this as sort of, again, kind of as a, from the perspective of war, right? This is a war that has taken tens of thousands of lives. Um, over just the past six or seven years. Does anybody know how many people have been killed as a result? I mean, just sort of ballpark. Uh, as a result of both the United States, well, mainly the Mexican government trying to make sure that organized criminal organ uh, groups don't traffic drugs to the United States or else anywhere for that matter. Just take a, take a guess. Anybody? Throw a number out there. How many people have been killed? Sorry? 20,000 higher. Couple hundred thousand. Lower. 90,000. Closer, but lower. 80,000. I mean, again, these are estimates, right? Because we don't know exactly how many people. 75 to 80,000 people in the last uh, uh, seven to 10 years. 
right? That's the, on the same scale as civil wars in Central America during the 1980s, right? I mean, that is the population of, you know, these suburbs that we have in San Diego, right? So it's a, it's a huge number of people. Um, and obviously, this is going to have implications for human protection, right, and human security. How? I mean, some of them are very obvious, but how, how, do, how does this have an impact on society? What happens if there's a war on drugs being fought in your country? Or neighborhood, for that matter. Oh, well, that's not the first one people usually mention, but that's, that's absolutely true. How does it have an impact on the economy? Uh, they have to make uh, weapons and uh, pay the police officers and the military. OK. So it, is that good or bad? I mean, because you say, like, if you're making weapons, maybe you're, uh, you're creating jobs, right? Or you're paying military people. You're, I mean, so maybe that's a good thing. Okay, so it could have it could have a it could generate economic growth, say. Okay. Yes. Well, it's sometimes very bad for the economy. For example, living in Tijuana, sometimes when the war on drugs got really, really bad around two thousand seven ish, people would not even go out of their homes at all. We would just stop doing things. And that kind of stops industry in so many ways. That's right, because if you're not out eating in restaurants or shopping in stores or whatever, right, that's going to have that's going to have a negative effect on the economy. Yes. Um, you're not you are not safe anymore. You feel insecure, and you like she said, um, you don't want to go out. But if you have, you don't trust anyone, and there's a you can see how separated cultures are. Oh, you are gringo. You are. We are from Sinaloa, we are from Jalisco. And there's, Tijuana is a mixing of a lot of cultures. Mm -hmm. We can see how, how we, can, we cannot trust anymore because we're scared. Okay. Okay, no, good, excellent. So there, again, there are lots of issues here, right? There's sort of the psychological issue of fear, right? And that's fundamental to human protection and human security. Right? I mean, just as living organisms, we have a desire, a need to feel secure. And if you don't feel like you can walk out of your house and be safe from any, any sort of calamity right, that might befall you, then you don't have human security right, or protection. Um, and that can have a psychological toll, right? I mean, and, but I think I like the, the fact that you broadened that to thinking about what's the broader implication for society. If we all feel that way, I mean, if I feel insecure, there's no way I'm going to trust you, especially if you're from somewhere different, right? Then, or you look different, right? Or your accent is different from mine, or wh whatever it is, right? And what does that do to society if we don't trust each other? It corrupts it. In what way? Uh, about the way. <laughs> OK. Can you give me a little more? I mean, what, is it, what does it do? How do you and I treat each other? If, we don't tr if I look at you and you look at me, and the, our first thought is, I don't trust that guy, and you, I don't trust that girl, how are we going to, ca can we interact? Uh, how are we going to interact that's different than if I just sort of were open-minded? Uh, like email? <laughs> Maybe, but, but I mean, but what if you're forced to be with me in the same room? Because if you're on the bus or in the subway or the supermarket or whatever it is, you're forced to interact with me. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just think about how, what that does to society, right? It becomes this vicious circle, right? Because then, you know, you feel insecure individually. Um, and you are interacting with people who also feel insecure, and we're only going to feed each other's insecurities, and we end up with a society that is much less secure, much less able to uh, work together, to be productive, right, than we would if we were living in a situ different type of situation, right? Um, 
So <clears throat> there are lots of um, ways that we can think about how, how, that ha how this, this drug war might have certainly a negative effect on society, but in particular how it's going to have an impact on human security, right? Uh, but actually, that, and, and this is all important, but, but what I really wanted to talk to you about today is how the, the drug war and the impact of the drug war has affected Mexican society in a little bit of a different way, um, or maybe in a deeper way. And that has to do with the fact that if we go back to this number of 75,000 people who've been killed over the past you know, seven or eight years, uh, there's a very small group of people within those 75,000 that have been singled out specifically because of their jobs. They've been killed because uh, they are journalists. Journalists trying to report information about the drug war, right? And publish it in the newspaper, put it on a blog, talk about it on their radio, you know, newscast or whatever it is, right? On the one hand, you might say, well, look, I mean, 85 people, that's, um, you know, this, uh, clearly it's very unfortunate. But 75, out of 75,000, why would you focus on this really small group of people, right? Shouldn't you be thinking about, I don't know, something broader like what is the impact of the war on drugs for the loss of life of men between the ages of whatever, 15 and 35, right? That that could have a huge societal impact, and, and certainly it could. But why do you think I spend my time studying this particular issue? Right, this particular group that's lost its life as a result of the drug war. What role do journalists play in society? Yeah? Please. They're sort of the ones that want to speak out what is going on around the world to you so you know you're informed. Um, and they are the ones that are attacked first because either such words or actions may make someone lose their job or their earnings, or they can produce a sort of conflict between politics. OK. OK, good. That's absolutely right. Well, I think in the US, we're like really proud of our First Amendment rights. And so the fact that as journalists are being killed for speaking out and exercising that freedom of press in Mexico, it kind of, like to all of us, it's surprising. And it just shows that they don't have those same rights that we do. OK. All right. So it, it helps us kind of uh, distinguish, perhaps, right, the, the differences that, that society, the societies might experience. OK. Good. What else? Yes. Maybe for bringing attention to issues that are going on. I think that by informing people, you know, that, that can be dangerous to, to what is going on in the situation in Mexico. OK, yeah, no, that's good. I mean, because that was, that was sort of my next question is, why are they being singled out, right? I mean, I mean, you might be able to, if you took apart that 75,000 people, you might be able to find other groups that were singled out, right? Um, mo many of those people, though, uh, were the people that were holding the guns, right? They were, and they just happened to be on the losing end of somebody else who was holding a gun, right? The journalists weren't, though. I mean, I don't, well, I guess I don't know that for a fact, right? They could have been armed, but chances are they were after information, right? How though, okay, so we know that journalists, you know, they, they, are, they form the media, right? They provide us with information um, about, they, they are a, a good perhaps um, measure of civil rights, perhaps, you know, that, that might exist in a particular society. Why is this important? Why are, why are their deaths important when we're talking about human protection and human security, though? Why, why, do, why do we care? Let's put it that way. Yes? Because maybe one journalist can affect more than one people. Maybe there's, you say, eight or something. Yeah, it's 
uh, but maybe they can multiply because maybe one journalist uh, writes some, wrote something in their, their blog and a hundred people read and information is power. If you know what is happening, you can act. But also, uh, instead of act, you can be distrustful, you can say. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be more insecure because you're seeing you are being informed, and that's, that's scary. That's right. That's true. Information can cut both ways, right? But I think your point, your, your point is, is really well taken. I mean, so for example, there are, uh, um, in Ciudad Juarez, which is the city that is, um, that joins Texas and, and um, the state of Chihuahua in Mexico, right? It's where El Paso is the sister city, kind of like our sister city in San Diego is Tijuana. Uh, there was a time, and it's, it's gotten a little bit better, I mean, but uh, there was a time where, like Tijuana, right, there were people who, people couldn't go outside, essentially, right? I mean, people were afraid, and certainly not at night, and certainly not to certain parts of the city, right? It was almost like a uh, um, um, lockdown, right, where you sort of, I mean, parents didn't want their kids to go out, nobody wanted to go outside. Uh, what ended up happening is that there were people, there were, there were netizens, right, these people who would come out and um, observe what was happening in their neighborhood because nobody wanted to stray too far from their neighborhood. But what they would do on their blogs was report the news in, their, in the neighborhood, right, and say, you know, in this particular area, you know, such and such is going on, don't, you know, stay away. And they would warn people to stay out of the neighborhood, right? Or they would say, you know, the avenue to get from here to here is clear right now. If you're going to go, go now, right? So, so they provided some basic information that actually helped people feel more secure, right? On the other hand, when you have all of this information and you see the breadth of the problem, it's really very debilitating, right? And even now, uh, there are parts of Mexico where, that are essentially sh completely shut off, right, to the outside world. That you can't, if you're not part of the cartel or the group that runs them, you cannot enter. And you don't want to. I mean, including the police, right, especially the police or the military. Um, but the, uh, so, so the, the press is really important for providing information. But the other thing that's really very important about this is how the information can be used to require accountability. And this is true, I mean, we think about this often in democratic terms because, of course, we live in a democracy. Um, and, you know, any country that wants to live in a democracy or claims to live in a democracy, right, has to be able to hold people accountable for their actions, right? Without accountability, you won't have human security. Um, so, this is, um, when we think about information and how, how uh, the importance of having information, I think we, we absolutely take it for granted, right? There we have so much information, access to so much information that our challenge is sifting through that information and figuring out what's important, right? But imagine yourself in a society where information stops. Not only do you lose the ability to, to know whether you're secure, but also to know what other people are doing. And if they're doing the wrong thing, to hold them accountable for doing the wrong thing. Right? Um, so the, the, that's really the point that I wanted to leave you with today, is thinking, you know, when we think about something like human protection or human security, we often think about it in psychological terms and about physical security. Um, many of you are clearly, you know, savvier than that, right? And you're thinking about it in, in economic terms and in terms of, you know, the, the broader social implications. Um, but, but there are, there are, we can take it even a step further, right? And thinking about what are these, what are the bigger implications for society when um, you, and something like information and access to information and how can that, um, how can that enhance Right, and how is that essential for human security? Um, so, 
I have lots more, but I wanted to, I don't think I gave enough time the first time around to uh, of an opportunity for questions. I don't know if you wanted to add okay, something or. So now it's the part of question and answer. So if you have any questions or comments to our speaker, that's a chance. You can be about about this, about that type of thing, about the drug war related stuff. We got in sort of a long conversation last time about that, but yes. Um, um, okay. uh, in a society like um, I have family also in Sinaloa, so I know because family uh, is, are some of them are in that kind of class. Mm-hmm. But uh, what, what I can figure out is what happens when in the society you become a bigger part of society when you are in a drug dealer, for example. You are a um, middle class in the Mexican family. Uh, one son uh, becomes a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. You start selling drugs or you start only helping, making the hands. And uh, suddenly and you become popular because there's no, uh, it's illegal, of course, but it became, uh, it's so open, the business is so often in Sinaloa, here in Tijuana, and what happens to society when it becomes a property, a good thing to become a, a person involved in drugs? Because you have money, uh, because you are you are powerful in some places. Uh, I have cousins that dream, their dream is very popular because it will be an economic uh, well, no, I think that that's a very good question, and I think uh, this is. Uh, we were talking in the last session about this that sometimes these these kinds of situations create what are called what we call in social science, you know, kind of perverse incentives, which is, in other words, an incentive to do the wrong thing. And th th this is exactly why there are many people in the United States, uh, and, and increasingly, I think, in Mexico and Latin America, who are starting to talk about legalization, right? And they argue that, that, that legalizing drugs is, um, would be better, not necessarily because they, b they believe in the freedom of snorting cocaine, right, but because what that would do is, re is reduce how lucrative the drug trade is, right? Because then it's regulated and you have to, uh, you know, you can't make these billions and billions of dollars off of selling drugs or, you know, you can, you sort of control it, you can quality control, there's a variety of different types of arguments for that, right? And, and so, the, and, and, and part of that argument then is that you take away the attractiveness of being a part, by legalizing it, of being a part of that drug. Of, of that economic activity, right? Now, I have, personally, I have very mixed feelings about the idea of, le of legalization, right? And I'm not sure that it's necessarily gonna work as well as proponents of legalization think it's going to work, right? Because then there's still a black market, there's still, there's still some things that have to be really sort of worked out, right? Um, so there has to be there even like, even if we tried if, even if we tried that route, I think that there would have to be more right. There would have to be some other there have to be other opportunities in society that allow people to sort of fulfill their potential, as it were, um, that are not that are not associated with that, right? And some so some of it comes down to. Is Mexico or any other country out there creating the kinds of economic and professional opportunities for enough of them so that people can have true alternatives to, to going from lower class to middle class, right? Or middle class to upper class, right? Um, and unfortunately, I mean, you know, uh, Mexico has not done that very well historically. Right? I mean, it's, it, even though the middle class, its middle class is one of the largest in the world now, um, there are still significant barriers right, to social, mo social and sort of economic mobility. And that's part of what makes the drug trade so, 
so attractive. Not to mention the fact, I mean, I think this, there are other broader psychological forces too. I mean, look, we all, we all go to the movies to watch the good guys kill the bad guys, right? And there's this kind of acceptance of the use of, of uh, uh, the use of force and militarization in society to solve problems that we then take and apply to the real world. And there's nothing more empowering than, you know, sort of taking a situation and taking control over it by, through force, right? I mean, just psychologically, right? You, there's all kinds of studies that show you know, what's happening in the brain when that happens and, you know, that type of thing. That's really difficult to fight against, right? So, so we have to be very creative in how we address the problem. But I think that the the bottom line is it has it, that there's there's no easy, easily identifiable, easily applicable. This is this is the button that I push, right, and then it and then it goes away. And and talking to your cousins and saying that's a bad reason to get married <laughs> to that kind of person. <laughs> yes. The thing that's really making the news right now is is of course Michoacan. Yes. And the fact that. People are so mistrusting that they're creating their own groups. It's starting to sound like civil war. Yes. They're creating their own groups to take matters into their own hands. Do you see a, a, a way to fix the mistrusting, society's mistrusting of the, of the Mexican government? Uh, I think, I mean, I think that that's exactly what needs to happen. How, again, I mean, if I knew how to do that, right? I think, um, I mean, this is very common, not just in sort of drug war type scenarios, right? I mean, we see this happen all over um, the world in places where people feel ultimately like they cannot trust the government to protect them. And they say, uh, okay, if you can't protect me, then I'm gonna do whatever, whatever is in my power to do to protect myself and my family. Right, and, and this sort of vigilantism, right? So people take up arms and they, they create their people's armies and they you know, do these kinds of things that are happening in Michoacan, right? One of the things, and one of the areas that, I, uh, I think I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic than other people who study this, but uh, I think one of the ways in Mexico that, and, and actually not just in Mexico, but globally, that is making a difference in, in situations like this is um, in strengthening the judicial system, the legal system. You know, one of the problems that, there are lots of problems with the effectiveness of Mexico's judicial system. Uh, one of them is that, is cases that are just not prosecuted or people who are, never, who are, who are put in jail and never receive a trial. Uh, there's, a, um, there's the problem of, uh, there's a really interesting film if you ever want to sort of get an inside look at the Mexican judicial system called um, presumed, um, yeah, presumed guilty. Uh, it's about this guy who was picked up for murder, sort of randomly picked up literally off the streets and accused of murder. And um, he, through really very a stroke of good luck, is able to get some lawyer, some students and lawyers to help him. And, and you watch his case proceed through. And it gives you a very good sense, right? There's no, there's no, at least until recently, there was like, we're all used to these television shows. Right, where they catch the guy or the woman, and they put them on, they put them on the stand, and then the lawyers come and they, you know, cross-examine and all this kind of stuff. None of that happens in Mexico. You don't have a public trial. Right, you really are essentially presumed guilty. Here, you know, well, we're, we we don't do as good a job of this as we should, but we're supposed to presume people's innocence, right, until they're proven guilty. Um, but anyway, one of the ways in which problems like this, I think, can be addressed, is if you have a judicial system that, A, actually can hold people who do things wrong accountable for their actions, right? That can provide a, a trial system where people feel like they're fairly treated, right? They're given a fair chance to make their case and to defend themselves and all of that type of thing. And that the punishment actually means something. Right, I mean, this, we have lots of problems with our prisons in the United States. In the developing world, it is much more common for, for uh, countries, I mean, for prisons to uh, essentially be run by the prisoners, right? So you, you don't have, um, you just don't have the same level of, of sort of enforcement and accountability. But Mexico is in the process of changing its judicial system. 
um, and has seen, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively new, so we don't know the long-term effects, but I think with that, I, I, maybe it's that I'm putting a lot of my hopes in that. Yeah, I do too. I mean, the, the alternative is sort of, you know, but, um, but I think that, that I mean, and, and, and that's how you begin to change the culture, right? Once you see the system operating the way that it should, right, in a fair manner, then you start to believe in it in a way that you, you don't automatically distrust it, right? It doesn't go back to the situation where you look at the government, you know, this sort of representative government and say, well, because it's a representative government, I should automatically distrust it, right? Um, as being corrupt or out to harm me as opposed to out to protect me, right? Um, and because you have to have a certain, even, even in the United States where we have lots of debates, right, about the role of government and whether government is good and bad and all of that type of thing, you have to, at a minimum, have some level of trust, right, that, that the government can, can be used for the protection of your best interests, right, assuming the right people are in power, right, this is kind of the way we think about it here, but. Um, good, any other questions? Yes. So how much power do you think and how effective is the U.S. government in terms of diplomacy, in terms of enforcement like the DEA, and in terms of like the potential legalization of marijuana or other drugs? Okay, well that's, all, that's a big topic, right? Um, I teach a whole class on that kind of stuff. But I mean the short answer is, look, on, well legalization um, you know, as we've seen, is going to be a state by state. At least right now, it's looking like it's going to be a state by state issue. Um, but, but again, you couldn't. You, in the same way that, you know, if you're a proponent of legalization, what you really want is whole scale legalization in the country, right? You don't want California to have different laws than Oregon than than Arizona, right? Because you you need to be you need to be able to enforce those laws uniformly. Likewise, you have to have similar laws in Mexico and anywhere else, right? Um, otherwise, you end up, you, 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 don't, you don't really solve the problem. The likelihood of that happening, I think, is very, very slim at this point in time. But, but it's changing rapidly, you know? So, uh, you know, who knows? Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, which drugs are you going to legalize? All of them, just marijuana, you know, that type of thing. Um, as far as the United States government, I think, you know, for a very long time, the United States and Mexico uh, made it a hobby of pointing fingers at each other, right? And the United States said, you know, Mexico um, and Colombia before Mexico, right, this is a supply problem. If you guys, you know, would tighten up your borders so that the cocaine can, couldn't come in from places like, you know, Colombia or Peru or whatever, um, and you eradicated the marijuana that's growing all over, you know, sort of the Michoacan and that whole area, uh, and the poppies, right, and all that, and you crack down on meth labs, and, you know, is get rid of the drugs, and the problem goes away, right? And Mexico would look at the United States and say, teach your people not to buy drugs. The demand goes away, the problem goes away. Right? So for, for generations, right, there was this like, finger pointing and name calling. Right? And it's actually been, I mean, very depressingly, only relatively recently that everybody has sort of come together and sat at the table and said, this requires our cooperation. Right? We, can't, we can't do this. We can't rely on one of us to sort of solve this problem. Now, that said, right, there, there is a huge kind of asymmetry, if you will, in, in kind of geopolitical power between the United States and Mexico. And the United States has historically used that power to um, influence its best interests, right? To try to achieve its best interests, um, which many times means sort of trying to dictate, well, but, but what does that mean, right? Um, and Mexico has spent a very long time living as a southern neighbor to the United States saying, you're not going to tell us what to do. What we do is our decision, but out, right? So again, you're at this sort of loggerheads, right? In addition to the finger pointing, you have this, this, this sort of situation where people can't talk to each other. Again, relatively recently, that's, sort of, that's gotten better. And you actually see much more, particularly under the Calderon administration, much more cooperative efforts, right, to um, on, on a variety of different things, and so it's, it's not was not uncommon. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it was way over 100 
of sort of big time drug dealers that the Mexican of officials caught, oftentimes with the help, the intelligence help of the United States, right? And then those guys would be extradited back to the United States for prosecution, right? Which was seen as more effective because then they could take them out of Mexico. If they put them in prison in Mexico, they continue to run the cartel from the prison, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that they can't do it from the United States, but it's a lot harder, right? So there's, I think there's much more cooperation in that respect. On the other hand, I think Mexico has become much, much more vocal over the past five years about saying, um, yes, we need to work together, but why are we fighting this war for you? You, 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 know, you guys are consuming all the drugs and we're fighting the war in Mexico? Like, how does that make any sense, right? Um, they also have been more, more interested in saying, you know, we, can't, we wouldn't have a war in Mexico um, if the firearms were not being illegally trafficked to Mexico. Owning firearms in Mexico is illegal. They don't have a Second Amendment right like we have in the United States. Virtually all of the guns that are in Mexican the, in the control of drug dealers are there illegally imported, not just from the United States, right, but from other places, right? And so the United States says, well, what, you know, or the, Mexico says, why are you guys letting this happen, right? Um, so there's a lot of points of contention, right? Um, but I think what's, again, if we look at this from the kind of the optimistic standpoint, is, is to look at how much cooperation we've had. And that's where the, the whole WikiLeaks thing, you know, that, that's happened over the last few years has been really very damaging because uh, there was all this trust and, and you know, goodwill that had, was built up and it was destroyed. I mean, you know, it's like once you find out what they really think about you, <laughs> right, then you, it's like how do you interact with them in the same way again? That's kind of what happened. It was not really that much different from being in high school, right? It's just, it's, it was, um, and, and there were, they're now the, in, sort of in the process of, of rebuilding after that. Um, but it is not a situation anymore, I think. Oh, there's a perception, I think, that the United States always tries to tell people what to do. I mean, that may be what we want to think or we want to do, but that's not really the way it works. Um, that said, Mexico understands that there is no way that they can get a real handle on this problem without the help of the United States. So they have to work together. They have to find a way to work. I think that's it, right? OK. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.